It's good to have you all back again. Hope you enjoyed lunch. And uh, we're ready to move into what I hope is a really uh, interesting um, conversation. So, um, so on behalf of Chief Langford and our elected leaders, and all of our Miyamiya citizens who are here with us today, there are several who have been able to come uh, take the day off work and, and come and join us. We welcome you to Nujongi Sipiongi Miyamaongi, the Miami country by the Neosho River, and we're glad to have you. This gathering marks the 26th winter that our community has been coming together on the last Saturday in January to dance. This winter gathering was born when Barbara Mullen and Sharon Berkebile suggested Chief Leonard the Miami hold a local community stomp, something we as a community had not done to our knowledge possibly since arriving here. Chief Leonard agreed and they prepared and hoped for a good crowd. Some 500 people crowded into the small Ottawa Peoria Community Center and that night, to everyone's surprise, Chief Leonard announced it would be an annual event. The gathering remained a one-night dance for several years. In 1997, the revitalization effort we know as Miyamiake e Mamuchiki, or the Miami Awakening, began with a two-year language grant that provided for one employee in Miami, Oklahoma, and the long-distance involvement of two key contributors. When I took the position as language clerk for the grant, my boss, Karen Alexander, the grant writer, directed me to contact two people, a Dr. David Costa in California and a fellow up in Montana named Daryl Baldwin, who had been studying our language and teaching his family. And I made those calls and the work of the grant project began. Our movement forward at times has seemed painful. We were limited by distance and with little funding available after the grant ended. But there was something extraordinary that happened during the two years of that grant. The seeds of revitalization were planted and they sprouted within our community. For the first time since our language fell silent in the early 1900s, Miamia people again had access to the language of our ancestors and those who sampled it wanted more. Their desire to learn was heard and tribal leadership provided as much funding as possible. Those were the early days of the tribe's economic development and those early successes would slowly begin to provide for a mamuchiki. But the immediate need for growth could not be achieved alone. It did not take long for us to realize we needed help beyond our means. We needed access to technology and support in building structure. We needed a partner, and we had an idea who that partner might be. In 2000, we traveled north to Miyamaongi to the town of Oxford, Ohio, with great trepidation, we admit, to deliver our request for help. And Miami University took a chance. The Miyamiya Project was born the following year, and Daryl Baldwin named director. We realized a tremendous opportunity had been handed to us and through a vision or a great hope anyway for a work that would fuel the needs of the revitalization project, we did not know nor could we have expected the little office provided for the Miami project and King Library would lead to the internationally known research and development engine known today as the Miami Center. In 2022, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the birth of the relationship between the tribe and the university here and in Oxford, celebratory events, publications, exhibits were held throughout the year. This weekend, to close out that celebration year, we've invited some special people here on the stage with me to engage in a panel discussion titled The Path to Partnership, Celebrating Naipwondingi Partners in Learning. Our moderator today is special to us as well, Cam Shriver, whom we love as the grandson of the beloved Miami University President Philip Shriver, is a respected Miamia historian today, an important, an important part of the Miamia Center family and most welcome part of our greater Miamia community. Cam. Hi. 
Aya Aya Cheke. Um, is the AV working okay? Yeah. Um, so I've been nominated to ask questions today, so I'll do my best uh, with that. Um, first, I'm, uh, the hardest part is going to be introducing all of these people. We asked a lot of people to come up on the stage, as you can see. No one took us up on it. Um, so I'll begin maybe with, uh, to your right, um, who's on the stage. Joshua Sutterfield has been an active member of the tribe's language and cultural revitalization effort for over 20 years as a student teacher uh, and a teacher, and he's now the tribe's cultural education director. Uh, Joshua graduated from Miami University with two bachelor's degrees, he's gonna brag on himself here, and a master's degree in 2009. His first semester on Miami's campus was also the first semester of the then named Miami Project, so that is in 2001, giving Joshua a unique perspective on the growth and impact of the nation's revitalization efforts. And next to him is Kara Strauss, who's director of Miami Tribe Relations. She's a Miami citizen. She earned an MS in student affairs and higher ed from Miami. She also serves as a primary mentor to tribe students today. Ketanga okay, Nate Poifer is next to her, is a Miami graduate. He's a Miami citizen, a non-traditional student, and was a history and anthropology major. He now works as an ARPA Nijongek manager doing special projects for the tribe here in Miami. Haley Strauss is a research associate. Uh, Haley, Haley Shea, I wrote, you did not give me your bio, so I wrote it. <laughs> Haley Shea, that's right, she's happily married, uh, is a research associate at the Miami Center. She's a Miami alumna, she's a citizen uh, mother, and she teaches in educational psychology. Kathy Young is a Miami citizen from south of Chicago. She's the wife of a pastor, and among her five children is the well-known Ian Young, an alum and attorney based in uh, Duluth, I believe, still. Kathy is also the grandparent of a current, current Miami student. And among her accomplishments are that she's the Crete United Methodist Before and After School Program uh, Director for 22 years. Moving down, Corey Foster was the Alumni Director at Miami University. He's known for making the chili for the first couple of stomp dances at the big new facility back of the old headquarters. This would be in the, uh, in the early 90s. Um, he's a powwow veteran. He's a lover of Barbara Mullen's grape dumplings. He's the fourth honorary member of the Miami tribe, which was delivered by Jill Leonard. And he's now retired in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska with his wife, Gretchen and two dogs. Bobby Burke is Emeritus Miami Tribe Relations Coordinator with a long career both working with tribal students and in student affairs at Miami University. And her first work with the tribe was in 1991, the year that Miami citizens first began attending MU. Next to her is Dolph Greenberg, a professor emeritus in anthropology. He's worked with many uh, American Indian tribes and First Nations bands in community-driven research primarily around land claims, traditional ecological knowledge. He's testified in federal court on those uh, issues, directed dissertations on Miami ethnobotany and place mapping, and he has always engaged his students in these varied efforts, a frequent uh, visitor to Miami. Reed Anderson is an emeritus professor of Spanish, and he was uh, the associate dean of the College of Arts and Science. He had an early hand in planning and supporting the establishment of the Miami Center at Miami. And upon retirement in 2004, he and his late wife, Fran, moved to rural New Mexico. He continues to live there uh, in Albuquerque, caring for a dog named Sancho, who's aging. He's grateful to be here. Now, Daryl also did not give me a bio. <laughs> so he's my boss. Uh, <laughs> seems to be a good guy. Um, and he's uh, the director of the Miami Center at Miami University. <laughs> so I'll begin with, uh, with Corey, Corey Foster, alumni, uh, former alumni director at Miami, integral to this story. Uh, individual relationships really played a big impact in um, the growing relationship between the tribe and the university. Can you give us a sense of the process of building those relationships? Uh, how did you, how was that kind of relationship building accomplished? in the 80s and 90s. Is this okay volume for everybody? 
Um, in the years 1980 through 85, I happened to be living in San Antonio, and during that time, I uh, went to Santa Fe and fell in love with native art and crafts and um, brought that with me to Oxford in 1985 when I returned to the faculty in systems analysis, which was my own degree from undergraduate degree from Miami. Uh, in 1985, after 1985, I taught for three years in the system. And in 1988, Mike Masechko, former alumni director, Mike, stand up so people know who you are. Uh, Mike had been a, a counselor in the, my freshman dorm and um, well, well known on campus, Naval ROTC and all that sort of thing. So um, got to know Mike then, but uh, he, was, he was gone when I accepted the position. I applied in 1988 and the basis of my application was that I wanted to get alumni more involved in lifelong learning. I mean, you can only do so many pregame social events, um, and, and we were well known for good social events, but I, I wanted to add to the, the social functions that we had, the opportunity for people to, to do lifelong learning. And so I think that was a major plank in my platform to uh, uh, apply for the job, and, and as unlikely as I might have been coming out of the computer business, um, they selected me for alumni director, and I took over. And that, that summer, one of those summers when I was, uh, before I got the alumni director job, I participated in a program at Miami called Craft Summer, and they had two, two uh, seminars on the program for that summer. One was called Black Pottery Making, and the other was called uh, Navajo Weaving Techniques. And I've never, uh, I couldn't draw a cartoon if I tried, but um, I took both those workshops following up on my interests that I brought from the, the Pueblos uh, when I would go visit in, in New Mexico. So I, I bring that kind of interest in addition to other things when I, when I took over a alumni. One of the earliest days that I was in there, in, in that office, a secretary walked in one day and said, oh my, there's an Indian chief downstairs. He wants to have coffee with you. And so <laughs> I go downstairs and it's Chief Leonard. I had never met him before. I'd met Joe, his son who was on the faculty at Miami. And so we had coffee. He told me about visits with Mike when he would come to town to visit Joe. And he invited me to come to a powwow sometime. And I think he had issued that invitation all around campus a number of times probably. Um, but by golly, I was, I think, maybe one of the first to take him up on that. And I think I came out to the Ottawa powwow, Labor Day powwow, and just had a great time. And I came back, I don't know how many times, in the next six years probably, um, for various powwows. And the chief and I became very close friends. He became a mentor to me for learning about the Miami tribe. And we would meet at, uh, the tribe was a member of a group called the Mini Trista Conference, and that was based out of Muncie, Indiana. And we would meet up in Muncie when he would come to those meetings. And I ended up uh, following up on that lifelong learning thing. The chief and I put together a two-part presentation to give to alumni as we went around the country. We went to probably six 
alumni chapters um, around the country. So if, he, if we, we, and we did have one in, in Los Angeles and got, went down to San Diego, uh, he flew into Los Angeles, I flew into Los Angeles, I was waiting for him with a rented car, and we did chapter events in two places, he flew home, I flew home. Our presentation in those chapters was, I would get up, get up after much study, harder than I ever studied for a class at Miami, study the history of the tribe. And so I would present the history in summary fashion, and he would present the current chapter, governance, problems, victories, you know, little wins and big wins and all kinds of things, but, and he would open it up for questions that people would try to learn a little bit about a real tribe still in existence trying to move forward to do lots of things, and one of those things was to um, educate their youth. And, of course, uh, the scholarship or tuition waiver program, whatever you would call it, started about that time uh, in those years that I was there, and um, that was a big, big part of what we were trying to get support for among the alumni body. So um, the, one of the best compliments I've ever received in my life, just so you know that I, back then I knew what I was talking about, was Chief saying, you give that presentation better than I could. <laughs> so that was a great honor to me. Um, I also took the director of lifelong learning or continuous education from Miami out to a conference of alumni directors that Stanford put on this time. And the whole conference was based on uh, Native American culture and relationship to many universities around the country. And Rick West, who was the first director of the museum, the Smithsonian, new Smithsonian Muse Museum at that time, uh, came as the guest of the alumni directors and you know, gave us all great encouragement for developing those kinds of uh, relationships. And Chief Leonard came to Miami many times to see Joe and his family. We would always try to hook him up with a class or some kind of a session with students to answer questions about the tribe. And that was all going on. That time before we get into the, the wonderful things you're gonna hear about of what it's developed into, um, that time was really kind of individualized efforts going on around the campus. A lot, of the, a lot of the professors, some of the professors becoming aware of the tribe brought students out here in the summer sometimes. And that kind of a thing started uh, around those years. So the other thing that happened while I was in, uh, alumni director was we had the opportunity to get Dr. Shriver, the president, former president, who was then teaching a course in Ohio history and the history of the tribe was a big part of that. Uh, get, we were able to get a jet plane loaned to us by a, an alumni uh, brothers who owned a company in Cincinnati. And, and Dr. Shriver flew out here for the Ottawa powwow uh, one year and it was the first time he visited here. And that was, I think it was an eye-opening experience for him when when an honor dance, Chief Leonard called him out for an honor dance and uh, you know, told him that whatever dollar bills are thrown on that uh, rug in front of you, you don't spend those. So, that, and the other chiefs from the other tribes from around here gave, gave him a hard time to gave Dr. Shriver, always with a smile on their face. So he knew they were just poking at him, but and it was about the redskin issue. Um, so it was starting to percolate on campus and uh, one of the members of that group that came out with him was the president of the student uh, government organization. He got very involved in that kind of thing. Um, 
And there, eventually that ended up with Joe and I sitting down one day, and, and I told Joe that this thing was really probably not going to get fixed until the tribe came to the university and said, we want you to change your mascot or change your identity with the athletic teams. And, you know, there were some committees put together. Dr. Risser became the president of Miami, held a big forum for people to say whatever they wanted to say about it. And eventually, in 97, it ended up with the Board of Trustees approving the change. But uh, Chief Leonard did, and the business committee did, uh, forward a request to the university to make that change. I think there was a lot of pressure put on by other tribes. Wilma Mankiller came to campus, and she gave an impassioned appeal you know, to a general audience, not directly to the administration, but um, that kind of thing was going on. So with the name change, in my opinion, that was the thing that broke through the log jam of trying to move this thing forward quickly, and it, and it did move forward quickly. And I was certainly proud of that. Um, and that, that's kind of, in my view, a nutshell of what went on before there was a university-wide coordinated kind of an effort uh, to do things. And this was happening mostly out of my personal interest in Native American affairs and out of the alumni office while I had the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's an excellent segue, uh, Corey. Thank you to uh, Bobby Burke, who was the first person to, to be institutionalized in between the tribe and the university. Uh, your, your counterpart uh, within the tribe, just uh, um, for background, was Sharon Berkebile, and then uh, that transitioned to Julie Olds. Um, what was it like for you, Bobby, in the 90s to take on this role before the creation of this Miami project? Okay, thanks. I hope that, can you hear me all right? Okay, great. Um, I'm going to piggyback right around with what Corey had to say because a lot of what I did when I began was connected to Corey in some way. And so that was a, a, he was certainly a really big help to me in having me understand what was going on around me. Um, I think maybe one of the big questions you should ask is, why was it me? You know, of all the people they could choose, why me? Um, back in 1991, there was an a, a issue that was going to come up where we were trying to create an exhibit that was going to be permanently on display in the Shriver Center. And I worked in the Student Affairs Division. And when I first started to work at Miami in 1989, I was a part-time worker. And so what happened to me along the way is another project would come up, and so then it would be a little bigger part-time job, and then it would be a little bigger part-time job. And so things just got added in as I went along. Well, in 1991, Mertis Powell was the Vice President for Student Affairs. And so she assigned people special projects, and one of the special projects that came to me was to create this exhibit in the Shriver Center. And so this was really meant to be an educational opportunity that would be visible across the campus. Uh, we would also have some events that went on around it so that you could meet other people that were already friends from the Miami tribe. So that was my first exposure to the Miami tribe, the first time I ever met Chief Leonard, uh, Sharon Berkebile, uh, many other people who became really important players for me as we moved through things. Um, and so that was in the fall of 1991. So then I went back to the other pieces of my job and didn't think too much more about it. Oh, and that, it was the same fall that the first Miami students came to campus. So there were three students that entered in the fall of 1991. Well, then another year shows up, and, and Dr. Powell says, I got another project for you. And so, okay, so in 1992, we had an opportunity to host a series of uh, a collection of portraits of Woodland Indians. And Chief Leonard was a part of it, and there were other chiefs from this area of the country. And so we took that opportunity, and she asked me if I would coordinate that and put together where we've had it and make sure they didn't get stolen. And so um, that was the second project that I did. And when Chief Leonard came to campus, he brought with him uh, Charlie Dawes, who was the chief of the Ottawa tribe at the time. Chief Leonard really wanted our Miami University students to understand that the Miami were not the only people that were in the Great Lakes area. And so he really wanted other 
uh, tribes to be represented too. So he did a lot of work to, in order to help us make that happen. So that was in 1992. And then I just went away and did the rest of my job. Well, in 1994, Corey mentioned this uh, forum that happened in 1993. In 1994, they put together on campus, campus people, a committee to study how to strengthen the relationship with the Miami tribe. Um, Murtis Powell um, is African-American woman. When she came in to be vice president for student affairs, she's very committed to diversity. And so this really played well for her. This was something I think she grabbed onto, and she was really happy to help support it and, and to help it grow in different ways. So they had this committee to study what to do, and there were a lot of different things that came out of this committee as uh, suggestions. And they parceled them out. You know, this one went to this vice president, this one went to this one, all the way along. So they were just divvied up, and she had lots of them on her plate. And so one of the things that the president, at the time, President Risser recommended was find somebody to be in charge of this that they can just look after it all the time. And so she said, would you like to do that to me? And I, I still had a little room in my contract. And so I said, sure. And so um, I have often said to people, I was lucky. I was at the right place at the right time. And this fell in my lap. And so um, it's from that point on that um, it became a part of my life and it became a consuming part of my life. There was lots and lots and lots of times for me that I spent doing different things. So in this um, commission, my, what I was assigned to do had four parts to it. One was that um, I was going to be uh, looking at Native American programming. So. By that time in 94, if you think about that, I think it was 1990 that the first uh, President George Bush had uh, suggested that November be the American Indian Heritage Month. It's kind of gone on all along, so we figured we were probably going to do programming in November, and so that was going to be a big part of it. Now, I would like to have you think about that because uh, it, that was pretty comical. Honest to goodness, I knew nothing about Native. Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. Native issues, Native topics, Native people, nothing. So I was not exactly the the expert choice in all of this, but I did know how to do events. And, um, and I also think that people in student affairs know how to build relationships. That's what we do. And the same is true of alumni affairs. You know, they're the relationship builders. And so these, these offices getting involved, I think, just were pretty natural places for those things to be. Another thing that we were, I was supposed to do was work on a visit policy because we'd already had some uh, visits coming out here to the tribe especially after those first students came, they brought a, a group to come out and stay at their house one time. And so there was some activity going on. But what we didn't want to have happen was that we would intrude upon the Miami tribe by having people who just called up and say, we want to come visit. Or else they just knock on the door and say, guess what, we're here. There's a group of 12 of us, what can we do? And so we created this visit policy so that we could help curb those kinds of things from happening, and then also make sure that any group that was coming had a purpose and, and we could help them uh, make sure they didn't do anything here that was offensive or cause any problems. So those were the kinds of things we were looking at. A third thing that I was supposed to look at was how to recruit Native students. Uh, this one kind of took a back burner, I think, from some of the other things that we did, but um, admission did get a little bit involved with us, and we did have someone from the admission office by the mid-90s who played a part with us, came out here with me a couple of different times, and so we were looking hard to try to figure out how to recruit um, students. And then the fourth thing was that as part of this report, they were going to create a steering committee to look at all these things that came out of the report. How, how are they going? What kinds of things do we still need to do? And so I was just going to help support that um, with Dr. Powell. Dr. Powell was the chair of that. Many of the people up here on this table were members of that committee. And so several different players from across the campus looking at ways that we could support um, the work that we wanted to continue to do with the Miami tribe. Um, in the summer of 1994, so I was kind of appointed to this in the spring, in the summer of 1994, I traveled with Corey and a group of summer orientation students, and we came out for the first time here to um, Miami, Oklahoma. And it was a wonderful experience. I remember being kind of blown away by the colors, the colors of the feathers and the, the regalia. It just was almost like it's overload. Um, but it was very exciting, and it was something that um, kind of drew me in, and I continue to enjoy it many, many times over. The fact that summer orientation came, I just want to stop enough to say, um, I want to make sure that I give enough credit to the summer orientation office. Another student affairs group 
that um, when Corey brought the group with Dr. Shriver, someone from Summer Orientation, those of you that might know, it was Linda Kramer, came along and um, represented Dr. Powell. And when Linda came back, she was kind of the communications person for Summer O, and she was very excited about including graphics and icons of some sort into the materials that were gonna get mailed to all incoming Miami University students, the brand new students. And so she was quick to follow up on that and what she wanted to do was add more into it and so as the newsletters began, uh, there were articles by Corey uh, t telling the history of the tribe, just trying to make sure the new student understood we had a relationship with the Miami tribe. And so I just wanna make sure that we give credit to the fact that from 1992, I think until current day, Summer orientation has always had something in its um, group of programs that said something about the Miami tribe. So I wanna give lots and lots of credit to the fact that I think they were really the first long range partner that, that ever entered into this. So let's go back to programming. I didn't know anything about it. Lucky for me, Julie, Julie Olds came to work for the Miami tribe because from the time that she showed up, um, I don't know whether she was excited about it or not, but she became the liaison to Miami University, and she was my go-to person. Literally, I, we didn't do anything. I didn't do anything unless we checked it with Julie. How were we gonna do this? Could she help us figure something out? What if we brought somebody from Oklahoma? How would we do that? And so she became integrally involved in what I was doing, and so she became the, the real link for me. And there were some really fun, you know, we had some things that weren't that great, but we had a couple of ones of programs that were really tremendous and I wanted to uh, just make sure that you knew about them. You know, those of you that have worked on college campuses, you know, if you want to help to get people to come to a program, well, partner it with a student organization. So I tried to do that a couple of times. And we had one, the program was in 1998, um, Black Student Action Association always started a school year with an event they called Unity Fest. And they always held a big outdoor event and they had lots going on and they um, were happy to partner with other people and so they partnered with us. And we told them we would bring food, we'd pay for the food and bring it. And so we had some native dishes there and that we were also gonna bring entertainment. So Julie trekked a whole lot of people here from here to come to the campus and we put on a stomp dance. Now those of you that haven't had it, you'll know what it is after tomorrow night but you understand that we did it. In the back uh, grassy portion behind the Shriver Center, goes up that little hill towards the CPA, and so that's where we had this um, stomp dance. You're gonna see tomorrow night that when you, um, the stomp dance is about uniformity. Everybody kind of tries to blend in. There's nobody sticking out, it's just there. Well, these black students really enjoyed individuality. And so they were really going crazy. Actually, some of the, the, the callers almost couldn't keep talking because it was pretty comical. And I think Julie can always make a lot of comments about it. So it was a great, fun experience, and we really enjoyed it a lot. Then Julie helped a couple of years later bring three different chiefs from here to a program, Chief of Chief Leonard and the Chief of the Shawnee Tribe and then the Chief of the Delaware Tribe of Oklahoma. And there was a wonderful program telling you all about their individual tribes and what they did. And then we put on another stomp dance. And again, it was behind the Shriver Center. But this one was different, it was at night. And they built a fire, so it was really like a stomp dance was meant to be. And it was very well attended. I'm gonna guess we were all there. And so it was just great fun. And a lot of faculty came to it because they'd never experienced it before, and so it was a wonderful weird way to share that with us. So those are the two things that I think really stand out for me as really outstanding things that we did. And then of course, one year, Mildred Walker, those of you in the crowd who know Mildred and her four daughters came, and all they did was make us laugh for three or four days while they were on campus, and that, that was great fun as well. So, um, and as we went along, as we got into the, um, the 2000s, we kind of moved away from programming because in 1999, I was able to get a grant that was um, like a service learning grant, and we offered, it was with um, Liberal Education Office, we offered faculty members a really small stipend to bring some kind of native program to campus. And through that, what I began to see is, if we want students to be in the seats for a program, have the faculty do something with us, get something that meets their curriculum, and they'll help get students to the program. And so that became the, the basic way we did things after that, and I think that was really a good deal. So if you notice those four things, it doesn't say anything about students in terms of Miami students. And I thought you'd be interested in this. 
the spring of 1994, in the school year of 93-94, there were two Miamia students on campus. They were the same two that entered in 91. One was a graduate student, and she was about to graduate that May, and one was an undergraduate who had another year in school yet, so two. So there wouldn't have been a whole lot for me to do to take care of two students. And I thought you would be interested in knowing that from the fall of 1991 until the spring of, two, of um, 2001, 22 Miami students entered Miami University, eight of them graduated, and seven of them left without um, receiving a degree. And for a little while, that was the common way that we saw with students. They came, many of them were, they, they got pulled into it as an opportunity, and they really, it really wasn't the right fit for them. And so they left for all kinds of reasons, but that was the pretty typical thing that happened. I would like to point out what then happened in the middle of the 90s is a handful of Miami students came to campus. And at that point, we were able to do some other things because we had people already who knew something about the Miami tribe and they could help share it. In 1996, we worked with Corey and we had a panel that did a little presentation for us. Corey was the MC, and then um, Chief Leonard was on that. Wesley Leonard was on that, and that, that Wes is the grandson of Chief Leonard, and he was very engaged and um, very active in the planning. Uh, Kimberly Wade, who uh, grew up here in Miami, actually is in the back corner back there, um, and she uh, was on that program as well. Wes was on campus from 94 to 98, Kim transferred to Miami from um, a year here at NEO, and then she came in as a nursing student from 96 to 99. And Corey Sutton, now Fenske, who's Chief's niece, um, came to campus. So we had three people who were really very well versed in the Miami tribe. And they did a program called Myths and Realities of the Miami Tribe. And to this day, it is one of the best programs we ever did. And I am just always kicking myself that we didn't tape it because it would be wonderful to go back and look at it again and see what these young people said about their experience with the Miami tribe. So I'm sorry um, that that didn't really happen. Just a couple of other shout outs that I think are important. When Wesley was a, a summer orientation leader, he was able to, um, Miami used to have that program, some of you might remember, it was called Miami Bound, and they had an opportunity to do different kinds of orientation, not just on campus, but they went someplace as a part of the orientation and got organized so they brought a group of people out here to work with the tribe for a few days. And Wesley was the leader of that. So imagine what that was like for incoming students who had the grandson of the chief who was able to tell them about this place and make, explain things as they went to things. I think that was a wonderful experience. And he did a great job of writing up a really nice report so that we had just way to look back on what are things that worked and some things that didn't work. And so I really appreciated that work that he did. And then the other thing is to go back to Kim. Uh, Kim was a really big part of my educational growth. Um, you know, one of the things I think for people like me who don't know anything is that you're kind of afraid to ask a question because you're not sure how stupid it is. And so um, it was just nice to have people who made me feel like it was okay, although Chief Leonard always made me feel like it was okay to ask him questions. But with Kim, she could really help me understand what was going on. And um, going to dances, she'd explain what it meant if one was doing dancing differently than another, why were they dressed differently. So I got a lot of education from her and I really, really appreciated it. Unfortunately, she has asthma and she really suffered in um, the Oxford area. Um, that Ohio Valley isn't so good for um, asthma and sinus issues. And so she was in the hospital a lot in Oxford. And so I got to know her first because she was always sick. You know, she'd come around the corner in the residence hall and they'd just painted the room and then she'd be in an asthma attack. And so it was time after time after time like that. So um, when we'd go together to come to Oklahoma or we'd do things in the summer, I really appreciated the help that she was. And then the more students that we sent out here in the 90s, Kim became the tour guide, the expert in protocol, etiquette, how to behave. Um, she did lots and lots of time, spent time with these students who were coming out here so that we we didn't get in any trouble. That's what we were most worried about. We didn't want any trouble. So that was the one that we, we hoped for the most. Um, eventually, as more students come to campus, my job when I retired in 2019 was predominantly working with students. And so the students who are here, most of them I know. I've known them well because I was responsible for a lot of different things with them. And so um, that became a big crux of what the Miami Tribe Relations job was all about. I do want to stop and say that um, 
Student Affairs was a wonderful place to be. Um, those of you know that, that know Myrtis Powell, you really worked hard to please her. You didn't want to displease her. And so um, uh, there was some anxiety in, in working for her. But another thing that I did was Dick Nault was the dean of students. And I thought it would be better if we had two levels of administrators involved out here. So Dick came to the very first powwow that happened in 2000. And from that time on, while he was vice president, while he was dean of students or vice president, he came to Oklahoma every single year. And I think that was really a credit to him, the kind of commitment that he had. He used to say that he thought this relationship on the Miami University side was part of a moral payback that we owed to this group. And so, you know, we carry the name. There's a significant importance to that. And so I think Dick had a really wonderful idea about that. He left the Dean of Students office and Susan Modley Howard came in. Um, these people were considered my boss at the time and so I did a lot of work with them. Very appreciative, very supportive and Susan is still involved to this day. Um, and so they get real committed in all of that. I think that's really an important thing. And we have the current Vice President for Student Affairs here. Put your hand up, Jane, so everybody knows who you are. Um, who I worked with as I was finishing up my time in student affairs, and I know Kara um, spends a great deal of time working with her and the other people. So I can't thank student affairs enough for all they've done in order to help this happen. Um, I appreciate that and, and know that they, even though the Miami Center doesn't any longer reside in student affairs, they're still uh, greatly um, embedded in it. So I appreciate all of that. And uh, so pushing forward with a couple more questions before hopefully we take a break. Um, and make sure that we give full uh, voice to the, to the other side of the stage. Um, we have informal relationship building in the 90s. We have formalization of protocols and really deep thinking about what this relationship will be uh, in the midst of a race-based mascot nickname change at the simultaneously almost. So going forward to read uh, Dr. Anderson as uh, Associate Dean in College of Arts and Sciences, um, can you help us understand um, whereas many universities want to build relationships with tribal nations, um, what did that look like for you as you, as you tried to realize that uh, going towards the creation of what became the Miami Project? I uh, thank you for including all of us on this panel. Um, each of us has a different angle on things, I believe, so mine comes from an administrative uh, point of view, but one which was informed and enriched, I think, by early contact with what was emerging as a relationship with the, the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. Um, I was chair of the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, which is the reason I came to Miami in 1981 from California. Um, I was one of the committee members of the, uh, the organization that Bobby uh, alluded to when finally we had an entity on campus that was charged with looking at how we can form and, uh, and cultivate, encourage this relationship with, with the tribe. That was the kind of charge that was there at the time and that, that soon became uh, more and more a formalized uh, request to work on a way to integrate our relationship academically as well as culturally, socially, and, and uh, in terms of just uh, relationships. Um, so I was part of that committee. I was passionate about the, uh, the mascot issue at the time, not really related to to y'all in particular, but it was a national uh, disgrace on many campuses and one that I thought we needed to address before there was going to be a sort of melting point at which our relationships might become more uh, intimate and, and less vexatious with the 500 pound mascot in the room every time we'd kind of get together. Well, once, once that was gone, once that issue was gone, I felt like there was a point at which things could begin to flow. Well, flow isn't a word you use very often in university politics. Um, we're a medieval institution, and um, you know, the first thing we think about uh, in addressing outsiders are questions like, 
well, are you a theologian? Are you an alchemist? Are you a musician? Are you an astronomer? Um, we can find a place for you in this, in this wonderful medieval institution that we have. Um, but if you're none of those things, sorry, um, you'll have to go and be a monk or something. Um, <laughs> however, um, when I uh, moved from the Department of Spanish and Portuguese into the dean's office as an associate dean, um, part of my portfolio in a way, if that's what it can be called, was to deal with things that um, were unusual. Um, interdepartmental things, cooperation among disciplines, um, finding a place for um, integrated studies, uh, th those kinds of things which are challenging to uh, a structure like the university and the way we, the way we award disciplinary uh, degrees in specific areas of other specific areas. Uh, it's a specialist uh, uh, organization. So um, given that structure, we began to think, what can we do to move this relationship forward in, in an academic way? The, 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 um, the watershed moment for me was after the first few visits to campus from delegations out here back to, to Ohio, was to have a phone conversation with Julie. And she called and she said, my brother Daryl is working on a degree in linguistics and he needs a place to work. He needs, a pla he needs an affiliation, he needs a place. And I said, great, um, give me a while to think about that. And uh, so, I, I mean, I also knew that, that, that the glacial speed of, of academic life and, and adjustments to uh, structure and all of that was going to be a factor here. Um, but I wanted to say yes, and I did, I did pretty much say yes, we'll make it happen. Uh, then I went home and had a drink and thought about it some more. <laughs> and, um, but but um, some of the challenges really were, what is the first response of introducing an idea like this on, a can on any, practically any campus? Oh yeah, let's, let's have a Department of Native American Studies. Um, okay, that, that's easy, that, that's kind of what we do. Um, however, it was clear to me from the start and from, from and this is relations, this, this is relation building. Part of what, what I understood going into this was that's not what we wanted. We did not want a department. Um, we did not want to have, um, uh, have this become sort of enveloped by the, the university um, structure and kind of dissolved in hundreds of different directions. Um, so the hardest, the hardest point I think to get across to administrators and, and, and colleagues of mine at Miami was that this was a project for the good and, and the future and the welfare of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. We're on their land, we're on their homeland. Uh, there are names all around that area of Ohio that, that are, are related to that original um, people of the area and we can't just stick them in a, in a department with other kind of uh, related uh, disciplines and so forth. And the other part was that this, the, the, the target, the outcome was going to be for the cultural revitalization and linguistic revitalization of, of the Miami tribe. And to explain that uh, in an academic setting took a lot of um, ingenuity. And uh, Bobby and Dolph can speak to that as well as I can. But, um, but the other directional notion of this was uh, unusual um, for an academic institution. Um, once, once this was understood uh, enough that we could begin to work on structural things, okay, 
facilities, salary, um, how are we going to uh, insert um, Daryl at first and, and others later on into this, into this structure. And I won't go into a lot of the politics of that, but, but it was, a, again, a process that, that, that looked like it was going to take not as long as it did take, I guess, to begin with. But um, so, so we began to work on what this might look like in terms of, of a, an institutional location where this could take place with the, the results and the, uh, and the outcomes directed toward the Miami people. Again, I think it was convincing enough when we began to work with other departments and, and to offer what our colleagues and relatives in, in Miami, in the Miami tribe could offer to other departments in the campus. And I think this has been one of the really essential evolutions of the relationship has been the extent to which the knowledge and, and, and all of the things that have been developed through, through Daryl's leadership and others, uh, I've mentioned David Costa as well, um, that, that then could penetrate out into the academic world of our campus. Um, how, much, how could we begin to establish uh, the study of, of, of Miami culture, uh, language, and so forth in our existing curricular uh, situation? So that was a secret, uh, at least from my point of view, was how that, how that could happen. It has happened, and it has happened in a way I think that's pretty spectacular at this point. Um, the education of, of Miami students at, at Miami University has evolved in a spectacular way. The education of the entire student body of Miami University about the namesake of the university and the first people of that area of the Midwest has also been pretty spectacular and unique and unique we couldn't find models. We looked around, we could not find models that were other than departmental um, of things that, that we really weren't interested. So this was an invention. And uh, I go back to that phone call uh, from, from Julie in my memory. And it, for me, that was, the, that was opening the window and the, the fresh air came in and we began to think about a new way a new way to address this opportunity that we could not turn our backs on by that time. Too much had gone on, and the next step was in a way the hardest step because it was a, an institutional step, but, um, but we took it. And Daryl will probably tell you a little bit about uh, the early experience of, of uh, being on our campus and so forth and beginning the work that he's done there Along, along with it. I want to mention in particular uh, Dean J uh, John Skillings, who was Dean of Arts and Science while I was Associate Dean, and his instruction to me was, that really sounds interesting, go make it work. <laughs> and, uh, so, and also um, President Paul Risser, who had an Oklahoma background, who got this whole idea right away. We didn't have to explain, we didn't have to convince, we really didn't have a lot of uh, uh, pressure to, to lay on him before he was out here visiting and cooperating and doing what he could to make it happen. So that's kind of my, my little um, you know, view of, of the situation from my point of view, and thanks for listening. I want to um, ask one more question, which is uh, one more question before we take maybe a five minute break. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, we can kind of continue the conversation, um, but I'll, I want Daryl to pick up on that actually, um, which is, as Reed said, there were no models, yet you did something. What did you do um, in 2001? Help us, help us understand that. You missed your opportunity to introduce me as the individual one. Well. <clears throat> For time's sake, I'm really going to summarize. Um, nobody could have planned this. We just knew that we were driven by a passion and a need to revitalize our nation, 
focused on language and culture revitalization at the time. As a small tribe in Northeast Oklahoma, we quickly realized shortly after the grant that Julie uh, mentioned that we simply didn't have the resources to, to launch whatever it is we were going to launch. And so the idea of reaching out to our friends at Miami University was really our only option. And so uh, I remember early on uh, working closely with Julie uh, and, and Reed, and certainly Chief Leonard was behind this, and I knew there were other administrators on campus that were behind this. But for whatever reason, there was an agreement, a little three-page document that outlined some basic objectives and goals of what was then called the Miamia Project, and three years of funding, three years of funding for one position just simply to get shot and see what might happen. And so I landed on campus in 2001. I, I've long suspected that um, they cleared out a closet on the third floor of King Library so I could have some space. <clears throat> I had a window, I felt pretty uh, excited about that, but there was enough room for me and one chair. <clears throat> but it was an opportunity. And that's exactly the way we saw it. It was an opportunity. I made some phone calls to folks that I knew that did language revitalization. They just, you know, they just said, follow your heart, follow what your community wants, move forward. And so it was literally one step at a time. From 2003 to 2005 were really our first attempts at community language and cultural programming and also attempts on campus to do programming. I began to learn some early lessons on campus. So I wasn't at King for what, maybe a year? I think it was only a year. The Center for American and World Cultures in McMillan Hall was opening up. I was trying to get some space in there. Uh, it was declined a few times and eventually um, the, um, um, the Center for American and World Cultures uh, said that they would provide space for me. And what they ended up doing was taking what was designated as their copy room, and they moved the copy machine somewhere else, and so I went from a closet to a copy room, which I was really moving up in the world quickly. <clears throat> but I remember uh, talking to Reed and saying, well, Reed, I need to move my office over to McMillan. And he said, well, you're gonna have to box everything else up, and you're gonna have to reach out to facilities, and they will move your stuff. You're not allowed to move yourself. And I'm like, well, that's crazy. And so, Reed said, I'll come in Saturday morning. You bring your stuff down, we'll throw it in the back of our car and we'll run it over to McMillan. And so, and so begin my, my lessons on how you get things done on campus. <clears throat> so in 2003, because there were a small number of tribe students on campus, I needed to figure out how to engage with them, how to take the work we were doing in language and culture and connect them with a small body of students that were already on campus. And one of the ideas was, well, you know, in language revitalization, the idea is to get people together, heritage learners, and to share the language and culture in that context. So I thought, let's, let's create a course for the tribe students. Well, <clears throat> there was an administrator on campus that said, Daryl, you can't do that. If you're gonna have a course on campus, you gotta open it up to everyone. So I meandered over to EHS and I bumped into Dr. Kate Rumanier and said, Kate, I'd like to hold a course on campus. She said, I can help you do that. <laughs> and so again, I learned how to get things done. And so was born what is today the Miamia courses where tribe students as part of the heritage program come together to share and learn about their heritage course language. The first employees didn't really come until 2007, 2008. Um, Andrew Stack was first, George came shortly after, and this is where I started to bring on uh, skills and talents that I didn't have. I was trained as a linguist, I needed somebody trained in education, I needed somebody trained in the use of technology. Technology was starting to develop during that period, and we knew that we could make use of it for a diasporic community. And so from that point on up until 2012, was really about developing uh, community education and putting together the elements, getting some experience, 
figuring out our own pedagogical development, uh, doing our own research in a number of topics. But during that whole entire period, I was reporting to student affairs. It was very intentional that when I came to campus, I was not designated to any department on campus, largely to keep me out of departmental politics. I often refer to this period as our uh, under the radar uh, incubation period because it really provided us a, a quiet time when there, were, there really wasn't a lot of focus on us on campus to really kind of explore what was possible and I think that that was really critical. Well in 2013 a lot of that started to change. Um, we moved out of student affairs. Uh, we were assigned to report directly to the research office and uh, we continue to re report to that office today. But what that did is it brought us out from under the radar. And also at this time, I think there were some movements on the national level uh, to begin to bring awareness, heightened awareness to the issues of language revitalization for indigenous communities. A number of things would happen that would put a spotlight on the Miamia Center and our work. Um, this was also a period after 2013 that we began to experience exponential growth both in terms of the students, the, the constant need for more at the community level, and, and so that became our real challenge and is our challenge today is to uh, respond to the growth that, that we're experiencing. And we also began to gain national visibility. 2015, the Miami Center became the home for the National Breath of Life Archival Institute for Indigenous Languages, which was a DC-based uh, program. Um, that has grown significantly. We began to engage with a number of different funding partners, both at the government level and at the foundation level, to begin supporting some of the developmental pieces of our work. We knew that the core of the Miamia Center would continue to be supported by the tribe, but it was really important for us to continue relationship building with funding agencies to begin to explore. And so as I say, the rest is history, and I know that many of you in the audience are familiar with that part of the story. I would like to end by saying that after listening to uh, my colleagues here who were there long before I was, Julie and I often talk about the garden as a metaphor for our work. And before you can plant those seeds, you have to prepare that garden. And I know that, that all of you at this table um, played a hand in preparing that ground before something like the Miamia Project, eventually the Miamia Center, uh, could ever take root and could ever plant the seeds that would grow into what we have today. So I wanted to personally thank you all. So. I'm gonna uh, use a prerogative and say we'll take a five minute break so that people can get refreshed and then we'll, we'll push on, okay? Anyway. This up or <laughs> you George? Want George looks crazy. Uh, that
One minute. We'll start again in one minute. All right, we're going to begin here. Everyone take your seats, stay away. I assume it's just in here. Uh, I don't recall, but. If you stand up, Cam, I'm going to to shut up. Oh, <laughs> So um, I'm uh, thinking about what we've learned so far, thinking about um, what we've learned about 
kind of the, the need to um, convince people to create space in a colonial institution like Miami University and then the actual work of creating that space for indigenous folks to do the work that they need to do. Um, transitioning to, to teaching and learning, uh, first question um, for Dolph um, is, uh, tell us about some of those earliest projects of service learning coming to Oklahoma, uh, the students that you had, the projects that you, um, that you did. As it turns out, um, the first Greenberg to descend on this community was not me. Uh, it was our son, Josh Greenberg, who came out here, one of the first um, service learning efforts uh, from the university is when Hugh Morgan brought out three or four students, and my son happened to be one of them, to help jumpstart the tribal newspaper. So I had to give kudos out to my, our son. Um, Service learning, it's an extraordinary thing, and it represented, the fact that this university embraced service learning um, represented, at least in my mind, a sea change in the way in which the university executed its mission. And I mean that in the sense that we essentially decolonized the university, this medieval institution that Reed um, referred to, that uh, the efforts that these academicians were involved in with regard to scholarship, that they were involved in scholarship was to um, study another group. That the other group, a community, whatever, in the social sciences, you study them, you write about them, and you study them under unspecified auspices. And you write about them, you publish it, you enlarge your vita, you get promoted, and the community is left hanging. That's a pretty gory scenario. And it's one that we haven't completely rid ourselves of yet, but we're working in that direction. Service learning to me is an opportunity to level the playing field, to, to finally recognize that the work we need to do needs to be community-based and community-driven. It needs to originate in a community like the Miamia to deal with and help them in some way build their capacity to deal with problems in their own sovereign way. Now with that in mind, this was in my wheelhouse as an applied researcher uh, because I've been doing this. When, it's, when Julie first contacted me, I was doing this um, for many, many years uh, in the American Southwest and up in Canada in the subarctic area uh, doing uh, applied work. And uh, questions that I always asked myself and I would always ask my students who were engaged in this, two questions, what's your purpose? and who's empowered by what you do? Those are critical questions. They needed to understand that. So when Julie came to us, and I know, where is Julie? Is she around here right? Hi there. Uh, I don't recall the, the phone call or whatever the hell it was that you got in touch with me and you said we're talking about doing uh, cultural reclamation, environmental reclamation, and also a hazards assessment on their, what were then, was then the cultural grounds. And that was the Labadee allotment, which was uh, about 600 so acres. Is that right? Yeah. And I said, wow, this is exciting, all right. And so I was with the Institute of Envi the then Institute of Environmental Science at Miami. It's now the Institute for the Environment and Sustainability. And um, I thought, well, this is something we can do. And so I uh, enlisted uh, a whole lot of students, and I said, you know, this, uh, we, we started thinking about what would be a scope of work for this, and we contacted Julie, and Julie laid out some of the parameters of this. We worked on it. I infused our classrooms that I was handling, at least, uh, with information about the, uh, the Miamia. Uh, I think I had Daryl over to, uh, to talk. 
and we began that process. And so what happened was that we, um, uh, after the term was over, uh, I took, I don't know how many we had out, Julie, I, experiential gerontology, I don't remember these things. Um, <laughs> and yeah, some people get that, all right, good. I'm happy, all right. Um, we, we brought the students out and uh, it was uh, a terrific experience for them. They got to meet with the uh, business committee. They got to see how and what a, a, a community was about, a sovereign entity that you had to deal on what we do in, in government prob, uh, work that I did. Uh, you had to deal with them on a governmental to, or government to government basis, basically. Uh, you just can't find somebody to talk to. You have to go through the necessary protocol as defined by that community. And that's important. That's very important. And so, uh, and off we went, and we did this, and the students, I think, had a remarkably good time, uh, productive time. Uh, I remember that, was it the Neo Show backed up, and we were, we were all in chess waiters on that property, doing our measurements. <laughs> I think some of the students were looking at me and said, what the hell did you get us into, you know? Here? And it was, um, and it was very productive, um, and I think, we produced the product for the, for the tribe. We identify hazards. We did some natural resource inventory. Uh, we looked at, did some, some very modest cultural resource uh, surveys uh, on the property. And uh, I think our students uh, were completely impressed. They learned a lot about community-based work and community-driven work. Uh, and that, that, that was a, a kernel that was, of, of, I think, embedded in their brains at that particular point in time. And the reason I say that's important is that one of the things that happens with students once they go through a, um, a, a curriculum and they are almost a, min a minute with this credential of a degree is that there is a, a kind of intellectual arrogance <laughs> that they think they have the answers to everything. And they don't, all right? And they need to step back and understand what they're here to do. So that was important. Now that ushered in a whole lot of, of projects that were to follow. Uh, and there's too, too many to mention, but I've had students working on uh, the restoration of the Miami um, lunar calendar uh, over the years, um, doing natural resource survey on, on uh, tribal property in Ohio. Um, we just finished, uh, before COVID hit, uh, we had a uh, pretty major project on cultural affiliation and archaeological connections that involved, uh, I don't know if Nate's around here, Nate Poifor, uh was involved in that. Well, there you are. <laughs> Where the hell have you been? All right, good. <laughs> All right, that's good. He did ex exceptional work. <laughs> I, I, all right. Uh, I was the, um, uh, in addition, I, I was the one that talked uh, uh, Mike Ganella uh, into, um, I had an affiliate professorship in botany, and I, and I talked Mike Ganella into um, uh, doing his um, PhD dissertation, uh, working with the uh, Miamia. And, uh, and his work, is, his dissertation is, is a, a foundational document. He did an exceptional amount of work, and um, uh, I, you know, I was so proud of him and, and so pleased with the with the outcome. Oh yeah, and that's, Daryl just, yeah, and, and Mike uh, Ganella still works with the tribe, okay? So that's all very good. So, the last 20 years or so of this, uh, with all of these, these projects, and they continue, and there's very, very, there's gonna be many, many more, um, I think has served the university very, very well
and more importantly, it has served uh, the Miamia community. I'm done. <laughs> I dropped the mic. <laughs> Well, uh, from service learning to, to uh, the, the student experience, um, and I really want to invite those of you who have worked with students who, or who are students or former students to kind of talk to each other, but I want to begin with um, Joshua Sutterfield, who works for the tribe, um, is a Miami alumni, um, to, to get us started thinking about the change in the student experience at Miami University over time. And I hope I'm not overstepping when I my sense is that it was not easy to be a Miami student at Miami University in the 1990s. And I will um, allow my colleagues and friends to explain if that has changed over time. Uh, Aya, anyway. Um, so I can't actually speak to the 1990s. As, um, as was stated earlier, my first, my metaphorical first day on campus was also Daryl's first day on campus. Um, so I saw the closet. He's not exaggerating. I had to stand in the doorway to talk with him. It really was that small. It was on the, like a third level of King. Every other light was out. It was basically a storage facility. There were really tall shelves. On the rows that had lights, every other light was out or flickering. And I'm walking to Daryl's office thinking, where is this guy taking me? It's a dark, dingy dungeon. And I really just thought he was going to beat me up and take my textbooks. Um, I mean, it was an awkward space. And then he really did go to a copy room. It really was a copy room slash entry hall. That's basically what it was. And so that's my first experience um, kind of as a student. Um, but then what I did see is another 11 Miami students on campus. And so I saw this small thing. There weren't classes. We had a few get-togethers. Um, which you guys will be able to speak to having many more get-togethers and a much more robust idea of programming. Because the, then the, the, the classes did begin a year or two later. I believe that Daryl spoke to about a year later, um, 03. So about two years later. And we started meeting. But of course, we're still talking 10, 12, 15 students. So quite small. I can't fathom 44. Um, that number, just I can't see that in my brain. I can't sit myself in that classroom. Um, so to have that and see it when, as an outsider when I come to observe classes is amazing. And so then as, as I progressed by my senior year, the classes had um, got a little more body to them. They had a little more substance, and we had worked through some of the kinks of what was and what was not working in the classroom. Uh, and then I stayed for another two years as part of a master's program, um, and we also had other graduate students, and Daryl had more help um, in his copy room, um, to, you know, to push the buttons. Um, and so the, the class really started to take substance, and I, what I started to see myself through those classes was bonding, was tribal students bonding with each other as tribal members and as family. Um, it became more than a class at Miami University. It became a Miamia space, a space where not only were we talking about our language, our culture, and our history, but we were living our language, our culture, and our history. And through that cultural shared actions, we became a Miamia family. And I imagine these people right over here can, can speak to that as well, the current students. So you can always tap some of them on their shoulders as well. Uh, I'll pass the mic and see if anybody wants to kind of add to what they're seeing. I don't know who actually came next in line. Um, we'll, we'll go that route. Sure. So I attended Miami University in two, 2009, I think, 2009 to 2013. Um, oh boy. Uh, I, to, to sort of add to what Daryl mentioned earlier, I, um, I, I see the class as having planted seeds, right, for me. I think before coming to Miami University, I knew what my Miami identity was, um, but I, I knew I was Miamia. I knew that that was an important part of my life. My grandmother grew up telling us stories. I say us because Kara's my sister. <laughs> um, grew up telling us stories about 
um, the Miyamiya community, but it didn't really take shape in terms of me understanding what that meant for myself until I started going through this tribal programming, right? But even still, even coming to Miami, I think I kind of took for granted a lot of the learning that I was doing while I was there. Um, I didn't understand the significance, I didn't understand the importance, but as Daryl mentioned, it planted seeds, right? And as I continued to um, grow and develop, I suppose, as, a, as an adult, I continued to have experiences that watered those seeds, right? And they've now gr continued to grow and will throughout the rest of my life um, into, you know, who I am and who I'm supposed to be as a Miyamiya person. Um, so I think for me, that's, that's really what's happened. I don't think I would have stayed at Miami, to be honest, without this program. Um, I didn't really feel connected to other, other spaces on campus. Um, I, don't, I didn't feel the support outside of the Miami community. And so had that not been there, had I not had you know, friends, family members literally on campus, I don't know that that would have, um, I, that I would have graduated, to be completely honest. And I know that I'm not alone in that. I've heard many other Miami students share that. Um, so that's a common, common experience that people have. And I, I do think it's maybe changing, that there is some of that, that climate is changing. Um, but for me, that was, that was what, yeah, my reality, for sure. Anybody else? Are we continuing? Or? Yeah, and, and, and also asking kind of what, uh, what have you, done with that you know heritage program how has it influenced what you've done after graduation as well either um dr haley shea or uh <laughs> ketanga as well yeah so i think um i'm i might be the outlier were you a non-traditional student in the be okay 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 um i was a non-traditional student so i wouldn't have gone to miami um there, there would have been 0% chance I would have went to Miami if it were not for the heritage program. And I'm sure Bobby can tell you this story about me, like calling her at 7 a.m. on a Tuesday <laughs> saying, I heard you have a program for me. I'll be there in like, what, two days or something. Um, and, and, and for me, my experience was really unique because I actually kind of befriended the Biamia Center staff and Jared, um, who is my age as well. Um, so I didn't really bond with the other students like a normal 18-year-old or 19-year-old would. Um, but my experience, I think, was really unique because um, I, I really, I think from day one, cherished the, the every Tuesday meeting um, because I, didn't ha I wasn't part of a fraternity or, you know, an athletic club. I mean, I, I was a 26-year-old freshman. It just, you know, I'm not going to really fit in. But, um, yeah, so my experience, I think, I, I really um, was lucky enough to have waited, actually, and... Uh, gone to Miami later in life and, and felt the value in it from day one. Um, so, so I think that's, that's really it. What was the, was the second part of the question? Oh, oh, okay, we're on that. Okay, um, yeah, and actually the interesting thing is, is, is um, because I, I experienced, um, I had such a positive experience at Miami, um, I, I met people like Dolph, um, uh, Julie Olds, um, who, who's the woman who hired me. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I met all these people and I worked with them, and I and I it was always such a positive experience. And when you work with people that are, you know, so, so well known for their achievements and and things like that, you you really appreciate the time you have with them. Um, but at the same time, I always felt like where we are now is such a unique uh, location in the United States. I mean, if if you go on Eight Tribes Trail, and you see all of these tribes that have been fighting for sovereignty for I don't even want to guess how many years, um, but it feels like such a unique place. So coming to work for the tribe really wasn't um, ever an issue for me. I mean, it's, you know, to, to move 10 hours it takes some time to figure out, but um, I did have to convince my girlfriend <laughs> to move to Oklahoma. You know, she's from Virginia, so it was a bit of a change, but um, yeah, you know, for me, it wasn't ever, ever something that I really had to, had to think about. I, being a non-traditional student, I worked in the business world and worked like that boring nine to five with that corny shirt and tie every day. <laughs> so for me, I, I thought there was no, there was no other option but to come out here. You know, it's, it's not something that people get to do, you know, work with such talented um, elders in their community. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't something that I had to, had to think about. So. 
So I'll go ahead and grab this mic again one more time because I have a very similar story. I was 27 and decided to go back to school myself and I was looking at Oklahoma or Oklahoma State and my mother had reminded me about Miami University. And in fact, where did she get the information? She got it from the newspaper that we now have for over 20 years as a result from the, of the relationship with Miami and specifically Hugh Morgan who helped us get our paper started. So my mother reminded me of that and I decided, well, you know what? It's expensive to apply to schools. I'll apply to one school this year, Miami, and see what happens. And so much like Nate, the fee waiver was certainly something that interested me. And then I started looking at their list of majors. And I came across this one that was called anthropology. And I, I, at that moment, I knew that's what I wanted to do. I'd been spending years and years as my working life reading different philosophies, different religions, watching different shows, and understanding that I really enjoyed people's culture. Um, my first try at college, I was an electrical engineer um, and didn't, didn't do that, obviously. And so I decided to be an anthropologist because I wanted to be Indiana Jones. <laughs> I wanted to maybe learn how to read the hieroglyphs. I wanted to be this big, fancy facade of what a true academic is. Now, they do have those skills. I mean, Dolph, I'm pretty sure, swings on a, a whip a couple times a week and uncovers some lost gold in Belize or something. Every week, I'm sure. But that's kind of what I thought I was going to do. I didn't really know what I was going to look at. Well, because I was going to Miami, mom reminded me of the fee waiver, I told my mother, let's go to the summer programming. So my very first program was 2001 language and culture classes at our longhouse, four miles that way, and that was my mom and I's reintroduction into Miami. I grew up knowing I was Native American, I grew up knowing I was Miami, but I had no idea what that meant. When I closed my eyes and I thought of Michikanakwa, Chief Little Turtle, as my seventh great grandfather, he was wearing a Suwin style long headdress. He was sleeping in a teepee because I didn't know any better. These are things our ancestors never did. I did not know that. The only people I met and knew was now going to become my new family, and that was the Baldwins. I'd met Daryl, I'd met the kids at that 2001. So who did I, of course, try to talk to and hang out with my first semester? The Baldwins. I remember all the four kids. None of them were in high school yet. Several worked for us and with us. Elliot, you were still in diapers. Where, where are you? Um, and so Daryl puts me on his barn, by the way. I had, I had to roof a barn to, I guess, you know, earn my keep in the Baldwin family. I almost fell off twice. Um, but they were my family. I didn't have anybody else. So by going to Miami, I got this new family, and it helped me extend my idea of what family meant. It wasn't just the Sutterfields. But going back to anthropology, what I started doing was Daryl and some of my professors would suggest doing something on Miami or Miami at the time. We really didn't use that as much as, as we probably should have. So I started incorporating my, my papers and my projects to be Miami. I had no idea that I could do that. It wasn't in my head that I would be able to start not under understanding what anthropology meant, but understanding what being Miami meant. So it changed my identity both as an academic, but then as a person. My identity started to become Miamia. Not Indian, not just a kid from Tulsa, an urban kid in the middle of Tulsa, Oklahoma, but Miamia. And so all of my programming really switched, both inside my head and on my papers for academics. And as I continued, um, I was about to graduate, and there was this opportunity for uh, stage two of the Miamia mapping project. So I was asked, would I enjoy doing that? And I did. I, honestly, I didn't want to leave Oxford. I love that little town. Um, I enjoyed my six years there. So I did, decided to do that. That was coming to an end. And Julie Olds gives me a call or an email or something and asks, would I be interested in working full time for the tribe? My sophomore year, they'd given me an opportunity to work on a grant. And so I had already got a little bit of action of working with the tribe. So that she then offered me this opportunity. I came back and I worked in the cultural resources office for a few years uh, and then decided to leave and go do some work, uh, some, some PhD work at Arkansas. That was coming to a close. And wouldn't you know, my phone rang again. And guess who it was? 
it was Miss Julio's one more time. And so through my academics, changing not only my identity as a human, but my identity as an academic, because I never really thought about being a Native American anthropologist, or more specifically, a Miamia anthropologist. So those, that experience changed, changed my entire life, and in fact, it did change the life of the rest of my family, my niece and my mother uh, as well. And if we get around to that, we'll all share more of that. So to expand my story a little bit, I attended um, the first A Mom with Chicke program uh, back in 2005. You saw me in the lovely Ding shirt on a picture before. Uh, it's very, very cute. Um, <laughs> So I attended that as a youth, um, came with my cousins actually, um, and I had an awesome experience, right? Like I met a lot of people there that, you know, went on to be my peers in college, um, again, planted those seeds. As I was leaving undergrad, I was, I knew, I was a psychology major and I knew that I wanted to go on to pursue something <laughs> after that, but I didn't know what. So I had conversations with Daryl and George about what I could do to give back to the tribe in some way. None of us knew what that would look like, but they encouraged me to do something that I could, that could stand on my own, but that I could also come back and work in some capacity if my path went that, that direction, right? <clears throat> and so at that point, right, my goal, my number one idea uh, purpose was to give back to the tribe, right? This is a, this was a value that was instilled in me through the, um, you know, the Imamo Chicke program, the summer camps, through the heritage course. I had been given so much, right? Like so much of my life, so much of my identity, so much of who I am as a person came from participating in these programs. And I knew that that meant that I needed to come and, and essentially pay, pay that forward back to the tribe, right? And so that became my number one goal. And I, I attended Iowa State University for a PhD in counseling psychology. Um, and, and that's what led me back to Miami. I did my doctoral internship at the counseling center at Miami, all, all to eventually work as part of the Office of, of Assessment and Evaluation, doing work um, studying the impact of all of this on language and, or on um, wellness or well-being, what we call nahimetus in a wingi, or living well within our community. Um, you know, and this is just, it's, it's an interesting question, right, of like how, do, how does working for the tribe impact me, right, or working for the Miami Center impact me, because it's my everyday life, <laughs> right, it's, it is just who I am. It's hard to articulate something that is just your lived experience. Um, and so, so I guess that, that's what I'll leave this with is it's everything for me, right, at least working for the tribe is everything, or for the Miami Center specifically. I think uh, it's, it's important to mention that who you're hearing right now are the real exceptions in this program. And it's a wonderful comment to say that they have chosen to devote their careers to this tribe. But that is certainly not the typical experience for most of the Miami students who come to Miami University. But it's been interesting to look at it over time. So I think if we could say almost throughout the entire 2000s and well, well into the next um, decade as well, those students came to came together um, every week in this class, and maybe they knew the names of the people who sat in their team at the table, and maybe they didn't know the names of anybody else. They weren't doing a lot of mingling. They were just in a class. And then all of a sudden, one time, we were all watching what's going on, class ends, and they started talking to each other about going to dinner together. It, there was a change in the way they interacted with each other. And so that's what I think we see nowadays. We see this, they are a Miamia group, but you know, they're just like all the other students who come to college. What they have when they first get there is immediate connection to something. They don't have to wait weeks to find the person that they think is like them. It's just immediate. And it's even more intense because they are related to each other. It may be somebody they've never met before, but they have a, re a relationship, and that makes all the difference. And when whoever's teaching their class can say, when this happened to our community, it's all of them. 
And there is a real special thing that you see in that class about how they relate. The other thing is there is a good evaluation program going on where we hear from every one of them that there is a big difference of who they thought they were as a Miamia person when they entered versus who they think they are as a Miamia person as they leave. So that's, that's almost 100% across the board. So they all have that same experience. Um, and it's really a wonderful thing to see. Can't say enough about it. A lot of times it takes one person who says, hey, let's go be on a room ball together, team together, whatever it is. But they've started that interaction that's really very unique and extremely interesting and fun to see. And I want to be sure to bring in um, someone who I, I've heard speak on this so eloquently um, and a different perspective, which is Kathy Young, pictured here. We don't think about the ripples outside of the students, but uh, can you tell us a bit about your experience as a Miami woman uh, and the parent of a Miami student, someone maybe indirectly connected to this, uh, this whole project? Thank you. And I also want to thank William Madro for making my ability to take notes up here possible, and I told him I was going to do that. I did not bring my pen, so Bill, thank you, darling. Um, um, First off, I want to say how humbled I am to be here. Um, I, too, am part of the generation whose grandfather um, was, was um, the son of a, a Miami a woman, orphaned at the age of four. Um, I knew growing up also that I was Miami. I did not know exactly what that meant. When my children had units studying Indians um, in elementary school, we always chose the Miami and tried to find as much information as we could on the tribe, which I'm sure most of it was wrong. But anyway, we tried, right? So when I was looking at a newsletter about the time that our son Ian was, was looking for colleges, I happened to see in an NMI, Miami MNI newsletter that they were mentioning names of, of students that had gone off to Miami University on the Heritage Scholarship. And I thought, oh, because Ian's dad is a Methodist minister, so we are not looking at gobs of money here, guys, <laughs> you know. And we knew that we had a kid that seemed to not only be smart, but a smart aleck. So um, he tested high like his father, thank God. Um, so I said, you know, we need, to, we need to check this out. You know, we need to check this out. So he applied at University of Chicago and Miami of Ohio. Um, he made it into Miami of Ohio. He was accepted, and he, and he got the Heritage Scholarship, I think, Bobby forever. As you, when Bobby tells us to stand, we stand. When Bobby tells us to sit, we sit. You know, we, we all, you know, owe homage to Bobby. So I sent that boy off to Miami of Ohio, not knowing fully what that would be. And about three weeks later, and I, and I, need, to, I need to move into, you know, uh, what Haley was saying. About three weeks after he arrived on campus, we got a call from Ian. And he said, I'm the poorest kid here. <laughs> However... And, and so what they're saying as far as feeling like, you know, their home was within, you know, that Miami, a group of students. Um, as fate would have it, Ian broke his ankle outside of the bookstore just two days going back to his second semester, his freshman year. And we got the call, Mom, um, I think I sprained my ankle bad. Mom... They think it's broken. Mom, I'm going to have surgery. So we came to Oxford, <laughs> and we stayed there for a couple of days. So his experience in his dorm was a little bit different because he had people start taking care of him. 
he had a group of Miami students that he was, you know, had already befriend, befriended, and before I left, I just looked at them and I said, I can count on you to take care of my son, right? You know, and they were right there in the dorm. So he, he formed these very close relationships that lasted for the next, you know, three years that he was there. So I'm almost grateful to that broken ankle because he really did kind of expand a little bit. Not that you guys didn't, but just he <laughs> did almost out of necessity expand out from his Miami cousins because of it, if you get what I'm saying. Then the next year, Ian almost witnessed two of his friends dying in a very freaky motorcycle accident um, on the high, his, his high school um, property. It was in the summertime. Um, his one friend had a crotch rocket, and, um, and Ian wanted to ride on it. So they went over to the high school, had a great big, huge um, parking lot, and he went around the parking lot and actually, I pulled in because I had a bad feeling about it. And I said, okay, are you done? Are you done? Have you done your thing? And he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. So was, when I pulled out of the driveway, then the owner of the motorcycle asked their girlfriend, you know, she was their buddy friend, you know, hop on the back, I'll take you for a ride. They went around the back of the high school. He lost control and hit the only light post within like 250 yards, killing them both. So the kids were waiting for them to come back around the high school and they never came. So they finally walked back there and found them both dead. So his world was really toppled because at that age you feel like you're pretty, you know, invulnerable, right? I mean, you know, you've got the world by the tail. So he was just really struggling, of course, after that. He had gone to Miami thinking that he wanted to study astrophysics um, but after being in the, um, in, in, in the heritage classes, he was sort of, you know, moving a little bit away from that. And you have to, I need to make this point too, because I didn't know Miami, Oklahoma even existed. And I have to say here, I think it's really funny that it's Miami here, just like it's Peru, Indiana, back there. What is it about the Miamis that have to, you know, it's not Peru, Indiana. No, it's Peru. It's not Miami, Oklahoma. It's Miami, Oklahoma. But I didn't even know that we had had forced relocation. I had no idea. So when it comes to the question about how this impacted my family, it's almost like, and I don't want to get emotional, but it's emotional, that that those heritage classes take our babies by the hand and tell them a story that's going to be very hard to hear. And not only that, and I'm holding the hand of the girl that wrote the blog about how to deal with generational trauma that once we tell you this really hard, real history about your tribe, we are going to help you know how to cope with that because you've got to know the truth. Come on, guys. I am forever grateful to you. And making an environment where it's loving, and they're going to help you through that. So Ian Richard would come home and say, guess what, Mom? <laughs> and I'd say, makes you want to feel kind of mad at somebody, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, we had to figure out where to put that feeling. And even with our own family, to find out some of the really hard facts about what happened to great grandma, what happened to her sister, what happened. Still just trying to put it all together, but you've got to know the truth. How can I ever thank the Miami Center for holding their hand through that process? How can I ever thank you for that? What a rich heritage. So getting back to Ian, he gave us a call and said, you know what, I'm beginning to think I'm way too social 
to study astrophysics, study the stars in the middle of the night, isolated on a, on a mountain in Chile. He said, I'm going to die. So, yes, the Baldwins were his family, and, and Chinguia is my bonus baby. I love you, my bonus baby. So, so Daryl and Karen talked to Ian and said, listen, because he went to them. He said, I don't think this is what I want to be when I grow up anymore. He was a physics, philosophy, double major, a minor in Spanish. So Daryl says, and I'm paraphrasing this, but Daryl, I'm forever indebted to you. He said, you know what, let's, let's do some internships this summer. So he arranged internships with the Jacobson Law Group. God love you for that one. Um, the Breath of Life um, um, program at the Smithsonian. And, and forgive me, I don't remember the name of the anthropology group, but he basically was working with a group that when any, any Indian artifact was found at any kind of a, a, a construction site, this group was, was, was brought in. So he was with them. So, so Daryl suggested experiences to just see what might click with him. And it was the Jacobson Law Group that really clicked with Ian. He, he fell in love with it and decided that he wanted to study native law. He wanted to be a lawyer. And if anybody knows my son, he argues very well, always has. So it was, it was a perfect fit. So that's how that impacted this mama. I did not have a Miamia name. My first cousins that lived in, in Peru had my, na my uh, Miamia names. But truly, my mother, um, who was from a very conservative religious background, really kind of felt like that was pagan. I mean, it's just how they felt. So we had a naming ceremony a year ago, November, and and I named 16 in my family, Miami and names. Come on, guys. What does it mean to me? What does it mean to me that the stupid language app wasn't working and I run to Chinguia and I go, Chinguia, not this weekend. I've got to have my dictionary. <laughs> I've got to speak it right. In fact, I even told him, I said, okay, so what's the Miami word for, for ignorant? <laughs> Because I still say, you are taking me by the hand. You are teaching me. You know, I would never want to say anything, Ed, I love you. I'm looking at you. I'd never want to say anything that was out of line. I'm just coming from a place of ignor ignorance. I am learning about my own history. I'm learning about this, you know, in real time. Um, but anyway, um, I brought my grandchildren to, to Miami in 2015 to A1 Sapada. I stayed in the Akana Lodge. Some people went, ooh, we survived. We, we absolutely survived. It was a wonderful experience, but still, I kept learning. I kept learning, too. What does this mean to me? This means everything to me, guys. It means everything to me. Um, and I wasn't going to cry, but I'm crying. I love you, Akima. You cry anytime you get up here. I understand it. <laughs> on the back of my chacos, on the back of my chacos, I have embroidered Pecacanawelo. Peca it was just the right amount of letters. <laughs> the right amount of letters. Pecacanawelo were on the good trail. That's what it means to me. Now, let me think. Is there anything else that I forgot? Well, anyway, Ian is practicing law with the Fond du Lac Band of the Ojibwe tribe outside of Duluth. Um, he's going to get married this coming September. I really still, George, want to have a stomp dance. You talk to me about it. Yes, and I know you're doing this, but you're the one that brought it up. Um, so... So it means a lot to me. And I have a granddaughter that's there now. I'm, you know, she and Ian were only seven years apart. And Shelby Lee is um, deciding that she wants to go into dentistry. And she really wants to practice in a Native community. Come on, what does this mean to me, guys? 
What does this mean to me? It means everything to me. So, Neway. From the bottom of my heart, Neway. It means everything to me. Thank you very much. Pam, you never stood up. I'm not going to stand yeah. up. <laughs> Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add that Kathy mentioned Ian likes to argue. And <laughs> I went to Hawaii with Ian, and he likes to argue. I can, I can vouch for that, yeah. We argued a lot. But we were, we're really good friends as well. So um, I think a really important thing, um, just really quick, Bobby touched on this and, and what Kathy said is important too, is we all came, and Josh a little bit earlier than us, but we all came at a time where there was established mentors. You know, there's a table of them over there. Um, we have a business committee full of them, Julie. Um, there's a lot of mentors now that have been, you know, I, I guess a corny way of putting it is fighting this fight of, of reestablishing the community. Um, so for younger people to have these mentors, it, it, we're kind of skipping a lot of the hard part, you know. So I just think we should, you know, um, you know make sure that we acknowledge that. And the, the first three students were Rachel Hall, Tina Holen, and Turtle Berkey Bile. So say their names, uh, in 1991 they came. Um, transitioning, um, you have a, a different perspective, Kara Strauss, uh, Director of Miami Tribe Relations, uh, in that you didn't go to Miami University as an undergrad. Tell us about that. How is this different from, let's say, other universities? Yeah, so you got to hear a little bit from Bailey, um, that she went to Awan Zapata, our summer camp, um, the very first year in 2005 program was meant for 10 to 16 year olds and I was 17 that year. Um, and so I didn't end up going to that program. I didn't make those same relationships. And so I kind of chose a, a bit of a different path. Um, I ended up getting a scholarship that meant I needed to stay in Indiana. So I went to Notre Dame for my undergraduate degree. Um, and so I have a bit of a different experience of what it's like to go to an institution that's not Miami, where I was very involved. I chose for the Native American community to be part of my experience. That's where I spent most of my time. And I was able to do a lot of identity development to better understand who I was as a Native person, um, as a Native woman. And I won't, I, I love that experience. I'm very glad that I had it. But I think, I can think back and recognize what I didn't have in that experience. And I did not learn one word of my native language. I did not play games. I did not sing songs. I didn't learn anything about Miami culture while I was there. And I got to see Haley and I got to see others go through this experience where they were able to connect to these things that were deeper than any experience that I could have ever possibly had. And so that's not to say that there aren't other um, universities that are very important for Native students to have these experiences, um, but I wanna just make it clear just how unique this experience really is um, and how meaningful it can be for our students. And so when I decided that I wanted to go back and work with Native students it, at college and recognizing that they need um, a special type of support, I looked to my family at the Miamia Center and talked with them about what to um, start, uh, you know, thinking about student affairs from a Native perspective. Um, and so I ended up going to Miami University to get a master's degree in student affairs, um, have an assistantship at the Miamia Center, and now to work with our Miamia students, right? And I think I bring a unique perspective as a Miamia woman to that experience of walking into a room and greeting them, right? And saying, I Awe Malaka Koke, hello my relatives. It's just a very different experience than you can get at any other college, <laughs> walking into a room where there's 40 plus of your relatives, right, who you get to have this experience with. And so I, I just want to make it clear, I think, to our community and to everyone else that this is such a unique opportunity. And I think that's how 
important planting these seeds are that grow up into all of these folks, not just at this table, but all across our community who are becoming that next generation of knowers and, and leaders in our community. Um, as a way of wrapping up, it's, it's important, uh, I guess, to recognize the, the hard-won um, successes. Um, and I'm wondering, um, just out loud, where this, what this will look like in another 50 years, um, if, it's, if it survives uh, to the century mark. Um, but I want to make sure that we thank our panelists on both sides and allow anyone uh, in the audience who has anything to say, um, to say it. Yeah, we'll take uh, five minutes and then George will tell us about story listening and stomp dance. Thank you, Mission Mission, anyway. <laughs> <laughs>